entrance of our institute. And uh, these are just, you know, every year, especially just around this time of year in May, a lot of children, uh, because of the upcoming summer holidays, begin their limb lengthening and reconstructive journey. And so this is just a, one group of them from a few years ago, all with either CFD or fibular hemimelia or tibial hemimelia, you know, all about to start uh, lengthening around the same time. So, um, so we're going to talk about the super hip procedure. And, um, but we need to back up and uh, talk about the classification of CFD. So uh, I think most of you are familiar with this. It's a four part classification. And type one, which is divided into A and B, has, uh, is an intact femur with, uh, um, so you have an ossific nucleus of a femoral head. You have a, a femoral neck, which may or may not be ossified. You have greater trochanter, you have the shaft, you have a, um, and you have a knee joint, you have a distal epiphysis and so on. Um, and usually, usually the patella is present. Uh, type two, you have a true disconnect, pseudarthrosis, and uh, type three, you have a diaphyseal deficiency. And type four really is a different disease. It's a distal deficiency, more affecting the medial femoral condyle and uh, very rare, probably the rarest of all these types. I won't be speaking about that. I'm gonna to speak today particularly about the very deformed type 1A and 1B, which are the most reconstructable types. So we'll talk about the super hip procedure. Now you can subclassify uh, amongst these types. And you know, in the type one, um, you can have uh, uh, 1A, you have a normal, basically a hypoplastic femur. And uh, these patients maybe have a little valgus of the knee. Type 1B, you have a retroversion. Um, and maybe a dysplastic acetabulum. And then the type 1A3 is the one that really has the coxa vera, all the, the deformities that require the super hip procedure. And uh, so for the 1A3s, we do use the super hip procedure. Uh, type 1Bs, these are the delayed ossification of the upper femur. Why do we refer to them as delayed? Because actually, uh, if you look uh, at the natural history, eventually these cartilaginous areas will ossify. And you can have a cartilaginous area in the subtrochanteric region or in the femoral neck or a combination of the two. And the, that, um, that delay in ossification, um, you know, makes it also um, uh, subject to many things, including breakage of these areas, uh, including dislocation of the hip, uh, dis, uh, you know, and, and other major problems, and it limits hip motion, you know, and we'll talk more about this. So the super hip procedure that we're going to talk about is used for the 1A3 and for all the type 1Bs. Uh, the type 2s, we're not going to talk about, maybe if there's time we will, but um, the, the type twos, you really have a, um, the pseudarthrosis and you can have a mobile femoral head or you can have a femoral head fused to the acetabulum. Uh, in both of them, you have a fibrous onlog connecting the greater trochanter to the uh, femoral head. And then, but uh, all a feature of the type twos, they all have a greater trochanteric apophysis. So if you really have a true apophysis, not just a cartilaginous remnant, then these are the um, these are the type twos, um, and the type two C has no femoral head at all, no acetabulum. And then you know you know your type threes also have various degrees of deficiency, and everything is progressive from less deficiency to more. And so typical type three, you know, may have a femoral head, it may be ossified or non ossified. I'm sorry, may be fused or not fused. Um, it's independent of that, but most of the upper femur is gone. There's no greater trochanteric apophysis. There's usually a flexion deformity of the knee. In the type 2B, there's uh, such dysplasia of the knee, you don't have much motion. Uh, so you'll have less than 45 degrees of motion, while type 2A, 
you still have good motion, even if you have some flexion deformity. And there can be a type 2C where there's either no femur or the femoral remnant is fused uh, or ankylosed to the uh, tibia. And you just would have an epiphysis here, ankylosed or fused to the epiphysis. And so that would be a type 2, a 3C. Type 4, as I mentioned, is a different animal. It's a, you know, it's a deficiency of the medial femur and the lateral proximal tibial epiphyses. The hip is okay. And that has a whole different treatment uh, uh, compared to all the rest. So in all of these, we're focused, you know, the original name, proximal femoral focal deficiency. And you can see why that is. This is a progression of um, more and more deficiency of the proximal femur all the way to here. But this is not, a, number four is not a deficiency of the proximal femur. So it doesn't really fit. I, I just felt uh, sorry for it. I had to put it somewhere and I've seen a few of these. It is a congenitally deficient femur. And so it got thrown in as number four. Okay, so we, we are going to talk especially about the type 1B. Um, remember anything I say about the type 1Bs, you could apply to the 1A3 except that you don't have to achieve ossification of the neck uh, or the subtrochanteric region, but the deformity is almost the same. So you can see, you know, in the, I started my career um, in 1987. Um, well, in 86, I went to, uh, I went to train with the Lazarov and with a group in Lecco and, and also visit various other people in Europe. And um, I started doing my own cases in 87. And that's when I began to be exposed to some of these type of cases. And uh, in fact, the one that you see on the bottom, the x-rays on the bottom on the left and right, this was a child that I, was, I saw in 1997. 1997 is the year that I, the light bulb went on and I finally understood what this deformity was. And um, I really did not understand that before then. So if you consider that I started in 87, and then I didn't really understand the deformity till 97, 10 years. First 10 years of my career, I made a lot of mistakes. I tried to, to bypass this. I, I did actually what Ilizarov did, which is just leave the proximal femoral deformity in place and then do an osteotomy to realign the femur. <clears throat> and um, that um, led to recurrent deformity. So I really, you know, didn't understand why is this deformity coming back? What am I missing here? And I think what we were missing is the fact that we looked at something like this and we said, that's Coxavera. And we looked at something like you see, do you guys see my pointer? Um, yes. So um, we looked at something like the top left and said, that's Coxavera. And then the second thing we said is that's the greater trochanter, you know, and or right here must be the greater trochanter. And then this entire part is the neck. And that's what we thought. Now these upper, um, the 3D CTs you see up here, um, we didn't have the um, benefit of seeing those until these were actually taken in the 2000s. So I never saw this shape until sometime in the 2000s. So we unraveled this entire thing without seeing an MRI or a CT of all of this. And, um, but, you know, finally I had figured out what is going on here. So let's proceed. So here's a great example. And I'm going to use this example um, it's a case I saw maybe around 2004, <clears throat> and um, it is a boy from uh, northern Italy, and you can see he's about 13, so th 3D CT of this is possible, and you can see everything, and, you know, th the lack of ossification here is, is 
um, isolate it to the um, septrochanteric region, this region here. Although at the, in the old days, we thought that was the greater trochanter. So you could even imagine the greater trochanter being split here, but that's not what the pathology was. Now, by the time I saw this boy, I fully understand, understood this problem, but I'm gonna use his CT <clears throat> to show you what the real pathoanatomy is. And you can see even from the x-ray, you got a nice femoral head, a very dysplastic acetabulum. You can see, by the way, this is getting pulled out. It's gonna dislocate with time. Um, that's a natural history of it. Uh, you can see there's the physis here. And then you see some of the neck. And then you see a, a very sclerotic line here. And then we're gonna discuss that sclerotic line is the greater trochanter. The whole neck is only this portion, this very short part here. All of this is the subtrochanteric region of the femur, the proximal subtrochanteric. And this already is the end of the subtrochanteric region where it meets the diaphysis, okay? So in fact, we were wrong initially. This was not coxa vera. This was not the greater trochanter. So let's look at the 3D. So now as you look at the 3D, and I'll move it around, you can appreciate that, well, I mean, so that's what we saw in the x-ray, femoral head, femoral neck. There's something here, maybe you see something there. You're gonna see that's the greater trochanter. And this is the subtroch region. And this is the delayed ossification. So as we start going around, you'll start seeing that is the lesser trochanter right there. Now, let's look there. There's the first view that shows you the upper femur. And look at this, a really incredible, a normal growth plate that goes from the greater trochanter to the femoral head all the way across, just like you would expect, just the normal growth plate. And there's the greater trochanter, um, and of course, this is CT, so this is the ossified part. Of course, the greater troch will go further. And there is the femoral head. I want you to notice something. There's the sacrum. Look at the direction of the greater trochanter. It points to the sacrum. Well, there is one muscle that runs from the sacrum to the greater trochanter, and that's the piriformis. So imagine if your, if your hip has always been in this position, Imagine how short that piriformis tendon would be. It's really contracted. And in fact, if you try to move this out of here, you won't be able to because you're tethered by the piriformis. The other muscles that you can see would be tethered. So this, if the greater trochanter, as I showed you, is there, it's facing posterior. So when I show you an AP of the pelvis, you can see that the proximal femur is flexed. So it's flexed 90 degrees. So you can imagine the iliopsoas, which goes to the lesser troch here, is very contracted. You can imagine that the rectus femoris, which comes from the inferior spine here, is crossing this deformity like a bowstring, is very contracted. You can imagine that the tensor fascia lata, which starts at the inferior spine, I'm sorry, superior spine, okay, and wraps around this, very contracted, okay? And the other muscle that's really affected by this, we'll understand when we look now. So there's, oh, there's looking from the back. Well, you know that the hip abductors come from the iliac crest here, to there. Well, normally, I mean, if you look at the other hip, they'd be going out to the side, okay? And so the hip abductors are very short. Why? Because you can see the hip abductors are gonna run from there to there, while here they're only running over to here. They never get away from the pelvis. Look at the short, the long distance of the abductor lever arm here, and look at the short distance of the abductor lever arm here. So the hip abductors are also very contracted. And because the top of the trochanter 
you can see it should be at this level, but it's way up here. It's, uh, they're really short. So that's our fourth muscle is the hip abductors are really tight. So we've got tightness of the hip flexors, hip external rotators, the hip abductors, and, and the rectus femoris. And this is all part of it. So part of the, the light bulb that went off in 1997 when I kept seeing recurrence was the part that I wasn't seeing. It was the invisible part. And the invisible part was the soft tissues. So the soft tissue contracture, once I understood the bony deformity, I could then imagine and draw for myself where are these soft tissues. And that's when I realized what I was facing was a soft tissue contracture. We'll come back to that. So I created a model of type 1B CFD. And this is this model. So start with a completely normal upper femur in a child. And you can see the normal side with a growth plate here. And blue is uh, cartilaginous. So you have the normal cartilage and there's the, the growth plate right there of the upper femur going across the top of the neck to the greater trochanter, which is non-ossified. On the affected side, we have a non-ossified entire proximal femur except for the ossific nucleus. But the neck and the shaft are 130 degrees to each other. The greater trochanter is at the center of the femoral head where it should be, the normal level. So that is our model. Our model is basically a normal hip, okay, but only looking at the upper, upper portion of it. Uh, in addition, if you want to look at the acetabulum, we have a retroverted acetabulum, okay? So our posterior lip is, is, is very small. Uh, we, are, we have a crossover sign and, and so on. So we're going to come back to, to that later. Right now, let's just focus on the proximal femur. So on the proximal femur, we can flex the upper femur um, so that the hip is uh, 90 degrees flex. And in this 90 degree flexion position, all right, let's look at the neck. Now that's because we have this flexion contracture. So look at the neck. The neck now looks horizontal, which is what you have with coxavera. So as you'll become aware, the coxavera that we're really seeing is positional in its, um, its uh, projectional. So the projection of the neck is horizontal. It's no longer a inclined femoral neck. It is a horizontal neck, like a 90 degree neck shaft angle. Okay, the next thing, so after we flex the upper femur 90 degrees, we can then abduct the femur from that position. So we abduct it, and when we abduct the femur, notice that the neck now has that declined inclination. So it's, it, it look, the projection of the neck goes from proximal to distal, most severe coxavera. So what we're calling severe coxavera is really the declination of the neck due to a combination of flexion and abduction, okay? And so this is the position of the upper femur in these severe CFD deformities. Now, what about the distal femur? So distal femur, we can, it's short, and we can glue it on to the neck by externally rotating it and um, attaching it to the proximal femur, which is in the deformed position. So this is the final deformity, final CFD. You've got the external rotation or retroversion. You've got the flexion, okay? And you've got that abduction of the proximal part. And you've got this apparent coxavera.
Now, doesn't this look like our original x-ray? So we've got this severe appearing coxivera. This here, we, in, we assume is the greater trochanter, but as I've shown you, the greater trochanter is actually way over here. It's right here in the back. So this is what we call the bump. Okay, let's look at it from the side. So when we look at it from the side, we can flex the upper femur. Now, I want you to notice something. When we flex the femur in the sagittal plane, what happens to the neck? Because this is a 130 degree neck shaft angle, the neck looks retroverted. So this position converts the normal neck shaft angle into the appearance of a retroverted femoral neck. So since the neck is normally 130 degrees, this becomes a 50 degree retroversion, okay? Relative to the horizontal, it's 50 degrees retroverted, which is a lot of retroversion. Now let's look at this. So now we abduct that fragment. <clears throat> when we abduct the fragment, it maintains that retroverted appearance, points the, you know, uh, it, it, it moves the trochanter more proximal, which therefore shortens the distance of the abductor muscles so they contract. So in this position, we have a very shortened abductor mechanism. We also have a very shortened um, piriformis muscle going to the greater trochanter because of that distance. It goes to the piriformis fossa. So, so and, and then you can see our tensor fascia lata, that's gonna be shortened as it both strings across. Our rectus femoris is gonna be shortened. So we are, I mean, I don't, it's a chicken and egg thing, which came first, the contracture or the bony deformity? We don't know, it happens in utero, but they go hand in hand and certainly the bony position promotes the contracture because the femoral head and neck never leave this position, even though they move. And then we add the distal femur. And by adding the distal femur, we also externally rotate it relative to the neutral pelvis. So by the way, everything is relative to a horizontal pelvis lying on its sacrum like that in the normal AP position. <clears throat> so we externally rotate it. So now you have an external rotation combined with an apparent retroversion, apparent. So this is a real retroversion with apparent retroversion, with apparent var varus, okay? And notice this thing. This looks like the proximal femur is extended, and yet we have a flexion deformity. Now you might say this is what, this apparent extension is what compensates for the flexed proximal femur. Otherwise, the leg would be pointing straight up, okay? So if we didn't have this apparent extension, then the leg would be pointing straight up and the retroversion helps with that apparent extension, okay? So it's a very complicated geometric thing. It, you know, it's interesting. So this model, which I, I'm hoping is helpful to you, this took me a year to figure out how to explain this. And <clears throat> uh, it has a little story to it because the artist who did all these wonderful drawings, her name is Pamela Ross. She still works with me. Um, I was trying to get her to illustrate this. But to do that, I had to convey to her a mental picture of these deformities. And I was showing her the 3D CT, I was showing her the x-rays, and she just couldn't see it. And, I, and really, I was getting very frustrated with her. In fact, I almost fired her because it was, I, I fired, almost fired her because of my own frustration, not really hers. She was just reacting to the fact that I wasn't communicating well enough. Um, it forced me to recognize that I'd spent almost a year working with her with nothing to show for it. 
that the, all the drawings were wrong. I wasn't communicating well. And so I broke it down into the movements that you see here. And from that moment on, even I began to understand it better. So now I can communicate and explain it. And in fact, you suddenly look at it and say, well, that's pretty obvious. It's not that complicated. <laughs> I, you know, it always is after the fact. I mean, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, when you really break it down now, is pretty obvious and not that complicated. But it's, it's getting to the point where you can visualize this and come up with the idea that was the challenging part. And um, so I, I conceived of this, I understood this deformity in 1997. So that was my eureka moment when I finally understood this. I couldn't communicate it properly, probably, till about 2011. And that's when these drawings were created. So, okay. So in 1997, I created this super hip procedure. Um, people often ask me, where do you get the name super? Why is it because it's such a super big operation or you need to be Superman to do it or you know, it's an arrogant statement of some sort, uh, none of the above. It came from, um, we were doing these procedures rather commonly and we have to, for billing purposes, we have to code every procedure. And as you know, this procedure has a lot of steps, there's like 50 steps and has about 30 or 40 codes that you have to put down in order to get paid for it. And um, secretary told me, you don't need to keep writing out all these codes. If you give this procedure a name, I'll add it to our super bill. We had this super bill, which included all the procedures that we did at our clinic. And, and that'll be it. And the moment she said super bill, I thought, oh, great. Just call this the super hip procedure. And it was intended as a billing code, not as the name of the operation. But my secretary started booking the procedure on the operative schedule as the super hip procedure. So she really named it and it stuck. And then subsequently my fellows said, if that's the super hip procedure, then the procedure that I developed even before this for the knee is the super knee. And then ultimately one of my fellows named the ankle procedure for the fibular hemilius, the super ankle. So we were kind of stuck with this name. <laughs> it was just meant as a billing code. Uh, I'd never really bothered to give it a name. Uh, most of you who know me, I just move on to the next thing. I don't have time to spend on stuff like that. Um, so I know these things are important to a lot of people. So this kind of stuck. So we had to come up with a acronym for super. And so the acronym for super, so that it wouldn't look like some arrogant thing that, you know, it's, it's such a super big procedure, only drawer Paley can do it. That, that was not the intention. Okay, never has, never was, was never, <laughs> you know, I get criticized for the name super hip all the time. Um, now I kind of laugh at it, but anyway, it's, so we gave it an acronym, Systematic Utilitarian Procedure for Extremity Reconstruction, which could mean anything. Anyway, sounds good. Systematic Utilitarian Procedure for Extremity Reconstruction. And that's what super stands for now. But that was actually, we came up with that a couple of years later, not at the time. So this, I, I wrote up the explanation of this in one of my book chapters and some people have found that quite amusing. So let's come back to this. So the first super hip was done in 1997 for a subtrope type. And uh, in fact, it was one of Dr. Hertzenberg's patients. Um, I, he showed me one of his cases and I said, ah, you know, that case would be best done with this new operation I visualized in my head. <laughs> and, you know, I can't believe he let me operate on his patient. Of course, it's safer to operate on someone else's patient the first time. Um, so we did it and it was a great success. Um, and uh, so, like I said, there is some history to this whole thing, which is rather amusing. 
Um, the case you just saw, you can see um, after the super hip procedure, and I, I actually demonstrated this case in Aschau, Germany. So this Italian child came across the border and we did his surgery there. And, and actually he's never had a lengthening, but he's ended up with a really fantastic hip. And I saw him not long ago and um, you know, now he's an adult. And you know, I asked him, what's the difference? He still uses a prosthesis. And his answer was that now he can walk as long as he wants, as far as he wants. Like before, he couldn't walk with his friends into the village to go to the pub or to any event or anything. It was just too far. He needed to drive. Now he could walk with his friends. He didn't get tired. Uh, you know, it made a huge difference. So, you know, there's all kinds of controversy about lengthening for CFD, you know, how much, you know, versus amputation and so on. My argument is all these people who do amputation, even if that's what they want to do, like a Symes amputation, still got to fix the hip. So the super hip procedure um, is a standalone procedure. It doesn't mean you have to lengthen, but you do need to normalize the hip. I mean, to leave the hip the way it was is, is you know, like this leads to arthritis, leads to all kinds of problems. And, and so you're much better off to fix this, end up like this, mobile hip, mobile knee, and then, you know, uh, what, what else you do, whether you lengthen or whether you just wear a prosthesis or whether you do a Symes amputation, um, you know, that, that's a whole different matter. Okay, so let's, let's go through this procedure. And this is a, <clears throat> I will start by saying that, look, this is, this is a procedure for people who are very familiar with the anatomy around the pelvis, hip, and femur, and knee. And if you're not that familiar, get familiar before you do one of these. This is not for inexperienced surgeons. I, I hope I don't create a rash of disasters by, you know, people going out and saying, I want to try that. And it has happened. Okay. Um, I'll never forget a story with Professor Elizarov. I was at a meeting in Houston and uh, someone who was just starting with his method uh, took on a very complicated Olier's disease and he put on a frame for the femur and tibia and so on, multi-level correction. It was a disaster. It was terrible. It was so many complications. And he was so proud of it, though. And he turned to the professor and he said, what do you think of, uh, you know, my case? And the professor said, that is my apparatus, but that's not my method. <laughs> and, you know, I always remembered that because I, I, see, I see people doing the super hip and... I, I want to say that's not my method. What you did is not the super hip. It's not, you know, and, and the problem is they label it. And if it fails, by the way, it's not they failed. It's the super hip failed. I always find that, you know, I think that's a quality of human nature. Is we, we're not good at taking uh, blame for ourselves. Certainly not in front of our patients. Okay. So please, um, you know, understanding this is one thing, doing it is another. And I don't think this should be done by every person. I think it should be done by regional centers that get a lot of experience in this. And, and I think it's important for every orthopedic surgeon to know so they can refer such a case to local experts. All right. So the first thing was we created a model, as we've discussed, of this. And when we start this operation, the patient is, is supine, but on a bump. This is very important. The patient is rolled about 45 degrees, okay? This position is very important. The bump's not under the back. The bump is under the ischium. And it's very important that the bump be right there under the ischium, as you can see, and that it really rolls the patient, okay? You need to be able to pull the bump out. And in order to pull the bump out, we actually 
put tape around the bump and make it into a string and pass it all the way up to anesthesia. And then when I say to them later, pull out the bump, they can just pull the string and boom, it comes out. Okay. No one needs to go under the table. Now, the incision is from the top of the iliac crest, so up here, to the tibial tuberosity. Now, if you're not going to do the super knee, instead of going all the way down, just stop at the joint line. Now, you might say, that's a really long incision. Well, my answer to that is, that's a really short femur. Okay? So this is not on that femur, this on a short femur. I guess if you had a really long, relatively long CFD with this deformity, you can do this as two sections and tunnel in between and leave a skin bridge. And in fact, we do do that on the odd case, especially the older children who present because they, they have such a long thigh relatively and you don't need that whole length. You'll, you'll understand why you need all of this length by the time I finish the, uh, the uh, description. You then elevate the anterior flap. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, this is, seems like the easiest part of the procedure. This is one of the toughest part of the procedures to do well, and especially with a cautery. So this is gonna bleed a lot. So I, I do this with a cautery, and I elevate the whole thing, moving the cautery very quickly. The problem is, if you go to do it with a cautery, you will create um, you know, multiple, multiple rents in the fascia, rendering the fascia useless for the super knee. So we're gonna harvest this fascia, but it means that it can't have big holes in it. So the cautery is harder to control than a scissors. And with the scissors, you can peel this off, but you get a lot of bleeding and it takes longer. So I take this whole flap down very quickly. The full thickness, no fat left behind, but I, I put it at an angle that I can really elevate the, the big flap. Um, I like to find the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. It's not critical, but I do like to find it and decompress it. But it does represent one end of where I cut the fascia. The other end is where the, um, the patella is. And where the patella is, uh, we uh, make a little rent in the fascia lata or the iliotibial band uh, next to it. And then we connect these two either with the scissors or a fasciotome. Okay, so that, that's the anterior cut of the fascia. Now, posteriorly, we put our fingers inside the fascia up to the intramuscular septum and we make a little cut down here behind the septum. So actually behind the septum, and we go up. And we go proximally. And then at the very proximal end, you separate the fascia from the gluteus maximus muscle. So you start separating the, the muscular attachment of the gluteus maximus to the fascia lata. And then you peel it off cutting it across at the muscle tendon junction anteriorly with the tensor fascia lata, going a little further with the gluteus max. So then you have this long piece of fascia going all the way to Gertie's tubercle. Now, if we do a super knee, we're going to split that in two, use the anterior half going medially, the posterior half going laterally for the, for the reverse Macintosh and Macintosh procedures. And then we're going to um, you know, create ligaments. If you don't need to do a super knee, at the end of the procedure, I just remove this, okay? So the, the fascia, removing the fascia is important both for exposure, but also if you're gonna do subsequent lengthening, your fascia will tether your lengthening. So think of it as the enemy of lengthening, so you take it out. Next thing is, to um, identify, you go anteriorly, identify the rectus femoris tendon. And a lot of times you see the first thing you see is the ascending branch 
of the lateral femoral circumflex. So you cauterize that or clip it, and then you can cut the rectus femoris. Okay, and you cut, I like to cut it completely, uh, frequently at the conjoint level so that its indirect head is disconnected too. Now, immediately next to that, okay, you're going under sartorius. There's sartorius. I'm going to go back and show you. So you're lifting sartorius and you find the rectus at the anterior, inferior iliac spine. Immediately medial to that is the femoral nerve. And the femoral nerve coming under the inguinal ligament and it's on the surface of the um, psoas. So this little um, cross section on the right shows you the femoral nerve, anteromedial on the iliopsoas, and the psoas tendon, posterior medial. So the medial side of the psoas does not have not a tendon, not a nerve, but the, the, the I'm sorry, the medial, the lateral side of the psoas. The medial side has both, one in the front, one in the back. And they're very similar sizes to each other. Now, you don't want to mistake one for the other, obviously. In a very deformed case, I will tell you that before I cut the rectus, I find the nerve because the nerve can be running right beside the rectus under here. So when you go to cut it, you could be coming very close to the nerve. So I sometimes now first find the nerve and then cut the rectus. Now you then elevate, so remember this is on the anterior surface of the iliopsoas. Now you lift up the iliopsoas adjacent to the inferior spine and you look underneath and you'll find the psoas tendon and you cut the psoas tendon leaving the iliacus muscle intact so you release the psoas tendon and that allows you to um, uh, free it up and you're really you know you're gradually releasing structures that are flexors your first one was the tensor fasciolata Second one was the rectus femoris, and the third one is the psoas tendon. So once you've done that, you're done in the front. You've released all of the anterior flexors that you want to release. The next step, to go posteriorly. Now to go posteriorly, the way you get there is by retracting the gluteus maximus muscle. Now remember, you found the gluteus maximus way back here. Okay, so when you took off this fascia, you took it off the maximus. So you already see the edge of the maximus. So when you come to the back, you retract the maximus, you open up the bursa, and you can find your sciatic nerve if you want, okay, and decompress it. And you look for the border of the piriformis muscle, the inferior border. Now, we're going to be cutting the piriformis tendon. Now, notice on this picture, there's an artery and vein there. So, in fact, you can usually see it here. That is the terminal branch of the uh, inferior gluteal vessels inferior gluteal artery and vein. Um, so the inferior gluteal vessels g run uh, posterior to the um, piriformis and they um, anastomose with the medial femoral circumflex, which gives circulation to the femoral head. So it's kind of a supplementary redundant circulation to the femoral head. And for that reason, please be careful and do not cauterize this, do not release this. Be aware of its existence. And when you cut, it actually helps you identify the inferior border of the piriformis. 
sometimes it's hard to separate the piriformis from the gluteus medius. So that's the border of gluteus medius. Now, what's hard to see here, gluteus medius is actually more lateral. It's actually overlaps the superior edge of piriformis. <clears throat> so gluteus medius, you can separate from here, but it is it has a very sharp posterior border. It goes to the greater trochanter, and it is completely separate from the piriformis. And you can find that difference. It's a little bit complicated the first few times. So you release the piriformis. It doesn't matter if you cut it at the muscle or the tendon, you're trying to completely separate it. Okay, obviously be careful of the sciatic nerve. Once you've done that, you then, um, the last muscle that is tight is the abductor. So now you split the apophysis. And you split it by splitting the inferior spine, superior spine, and then the crest of the ilium. And you split it just like you would do for a Salter osteotomy, cutting with a knife all the way across here. So, Inferior spine is easy to split. The rectus femoris tendon is on the lateral side. The um, superior spine is easy to split. They're both wide. The, the interval between them, the interspinous crest, is very narrow. And so try and cut through that. Uh, it sometimes has some vessels. It actually has this continuation of the lateral femoral circumflex ascending branch. Okay, when you slide this off, that's called an abductor slide. And on the inside, when you slide off the medial side, that's called an iliacus slide. So you are, in, in all of those, by the way, I mean, I don't know how it's done in India, but um, we have to code for all our procedures and we also get paid for them. Um, so that, each of those is a code. So that's lengthening of iliacus, lengthening of abductors. So we are slide, it's called an abductor muscle slide, iliacus muscle slide. And the iliacus muscle slide, of course, is contributing to the, uh, it's the last flexor you're releasing. Now the abductor, I said it's the last flexor, it's not completely true because the front half of the abductor reaches in front of the hip and therefore acts as a flexor, especially with this deformity. So when you take down the iliacus, I mean, the, sorry, the, uh, the hip abductors, you are also doing partially a um, flexor release. So you're releasing, it's the last flexor, truly is the hip abductor. So when you take that down, you have done everything you can do, extra articular to free the hip uh, uh, a hip flexor contracture, okay? And it's mostly a extra articular hip flexion contraction. You've also now treated the hip abduction contracture, which tethers the greater trochanter. So you've untethered the greater trochanter by releasing the piriformis and by sliding the abductors and by lengthening the tensor fasciolata. So again, I want you to picture these the soft tissue part, which is just as important as all the bony work. Notice how much soft tissue work there is before you can do anything with the bone. The next step is to um, cut the periosteum on the femur and elevate the quadriceps. Now this last step is the last muscle to move but this is not because it's contracted. This is for exposure. So you're exposing the femur, putting home and elevators under the periosteum, and that becomes your abductor release. I mean, your, sorry, quadriceps elevation, not release. Um, once you've exposed the femur, and where do you stop? You stop at the bony cartilaginous juncture of the greater trochanter. Okay, so um, give me one second. I'm gonna turn down the air conditioning in my room. I'm freezing here, one second.
Okay, I'm back. Um, so the next step is, is the beginning of all the bony work. And the bony work involves starting with injecting the femoral head capsule to, see, to visualize femoral head. So you're doing an arthrogram of the hip. And here you can see, I actually start with injecting saline to confirm that I'm in the joint because I don't want to inject the dye in the wrong place because it'll obscure what I'm doing. So I inject saline and with my spinal, I use a 20 gauge, the yellow one, 20 gauge spinal needle. And if the fluid comes back, I know I'm in the joint. Um, and then I inject the dye and you can see the dye going around the thermal head and the edge of the capsule. Okay, you can almost picture the greater trochanter there. Um, once the die is in, you can reposition the proximal femur. You're untethered now. You don't have flexion, you don't have external rotation, and you don't have um, the uh, abductor contracture. So because you're untethered, you can place the proximal femur in its anatomically normal position. So you can, you know, cross the leg and extend it. So you're extending it, you're rotating it uh, internally, um, you're uh, um, adducting it. And so you're undoing the deformity with the femur intact. And that's what it looks like. And that's what the radiograph looks like. Okay. And once it's in this position, you place your first guide wire. Your first guide wire is placed by palpation. You palpate the tip of the greater trochanter and you go into the center of the femoral head. And um, so that becomes the first guide wire. Then you place second guide wire. Second guide wire um, is based on the first guide wire. So in fact, the purpose of the first guide wire is to accurately place the second one. And so the second guide wire is 45 degrees to the first. And some of you might say, well, why don't you just place one guide wire up the femoral neck? I think that's what you're trying to do. And I wish it was that easy. The problem is the very small femoral neck, it's nicely seen in this illustration, but in fact, radiographically, you don't really appreciate the full thing. All you see is, is kind of an arthrogram like that. So you're trying to put a guide wire up a ghost. I mean, it's an invisible femoral neck. And so you place your second one 45 degrees to the first, I'll explain in a minute why 45 degrees. And this is the reason. So when we're finished, when this operation is done, you want the shaft of the femur to lie where this red line is. Now, what, what's the relationship of this red line? This red line um, is at an 85 degree angle to the first guide wire. So just remember the normal uh, joint orientation angle, the MPFA should be about 85 degrees. This red line is 130 degrees to the neck. In other words, a neck shaft angle of 130, which would be normal. So that would be your angle there. 85, 130. So to create that, if you look at this triangle created by the two guide wires, okay, where this is 130 and that's 85, then this angle, if this is 130 here, this must be 50 here, right? 180 degrees. And then rule of, you know, Euclidean geometry, this adds up to 180. 85 plus 50, so therefore this must be 45. So this is a very basic thing, okay? You know, the, 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 this is a, I use this for every hip osteotomy, by the way. 
The only time this is off is if the greater trochanter is overgrown. So if it's overgrown, <clears throat> of course, the, it throws everything off. But assuming that you don't have an overgrown greater troch, this is the normal relations. So you don't have to think of all this. All you have to do, use a goniometer, first guide wire, second guide wire, 45 degrees. So I place the second one 45 degrees, and I don't worry about being in the center. And then I go to the lateral, and I place a new second guide wire based on the first one. So the first one showed me where the 45 degrees is, but the kind of the second second guide wire is based on getting it exactly in the center of the head. Now, the center, this view is one of the most confusing views. It is a cross table lateral view with the image intensifier. And what you should see, okay, you can see it here on the, so there's the guide wire, but you can see here the dark shadow in the middle, okay, um, is the ossific nucleus. So that's the ossific nucleus there. And then around that is the femoral neck. And so you can see here this clear zone, that's the femoral neck on the arthrogram. And lastly, you'll see the femoral head outline, which is there. And if you look carefully, there's actually a fourth ring and it's the acetabular outline, which you can actually see here as well, is there. So there are actually four rings, but just Hello? Are we yeah, back on? Yes. I'm sorry. I, you got, you got, are we back on again? Yes, yes, yes. Back. Okay. I, I will proceed. I, I think I know where, where I lost you. I think I was explaining the, the lateral view. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, um, so on this lateral view, um, let me put it back on slideshow. You want to, you want your, your, your second guide wire was at 45 degrees, but probably not perfectly in the center. So you place another second guide wire based on the correct plane of correction. Those of you who are not muted yourself, you should probably mute yourself because it's disruptive. Um, okay, so again, just a enlarged view of the same. This first circle here, which you see here, is just, um, the ossific nucleus. This second circle is the neck. This third circle is the head. And there's a fourth circle, the acetabulum after that. Okay, once you've got your guide wire, and this is worth checking over and over. You can also do like a frog. The problem is because of this fixed deformity, hard to visualize on a frog, but I actually do try to create a frog view. Uh, it's also, Hard to visualize because you got a bump there, which doesn't allow you to abduct the hip very much. Um, you then use a cannulated chisel. Um, people ask me which which equipment do I use. We have two different manufacturers that make these cannulated blade plates. I again, you probably have different manufacturers in India. So it's made by um, Smith and nephew made the first one. And now I use the orthopediatrics one. It has nicer instrumentation. Again, I don't know if either of those vendors sell in India or if you have your own blade plate. A lot of people ask me, could I not just use like the LCP plate, the, the, the screw plate? I don't think it's as good. First of all, screws and cartilage don't do as well. This is a non-ossified neck. I think the blade does better. Um, also, harder to control and be as accurate. This is a way more accurate system. So if you don't have those, uh, then we should probably try and find a manufacturer who's gonna make those for India. Uh, but anyway, so we, we use a uh, cannulated chisel. 
And what's important now, so the wire is in the correct position, but remember the chisel could be inserted in any direction. You could flex or extend it. So this is where you determine the alignment of the chisel. And the way you do that is you put your finger in the back of the trochanter and the back of the trochanter should normally be horizontal in line with the shaft. You can, I've, I've put this kind of purple line there representing where the chisel should be perpendicular to that posterior palpable line. Once you put the chisel in like that, okay, and then you, um, you can appreciate, if you get a lateral view, how much flexion deformity comes from the bone. So some of you may say, you know, I did all this soft tissue release, but there was still flexion deformity present. And the reason is you still have bony flexion deformity. Okay, so there's a bony flexion deformity. And yet when you go back to my model, you didn't appreciate in that convoluted position that there was actually a bony flexion deformity. But when you undo all the soft tissues, it becomes apparent that there is a bony flexion deformity. Remember I called it apparent extension. Reason is, because when you flip this forward, you, when you rotate all of this, the, it looks like extension. This curve here is apparent extension. When you undo everything, you suddenly realize it's true flexion deformity of the bone. That's why I say it's a very complex deformity. Um, hold on, I'm trying to, my PowerPoint is frozen. Are you guys still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah everything froze. I'm gonna unshare for a second, sorry. So you can use the arrow key, sir. Um, nothing is responding. Just a minute. So I'm sure you can stop the... Okay. I'm trying to end the show. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Can, you, uh, can you do it from your end? Uh, I'm doing so. Undo my... stop. I can't, I can't unshare. Uh, what we can do is we can keep you in the waiting room for a moment, then it will unshare automatically. Sometimes this happens. Okay. Okay. They're putting in waiting room. Some should now try to uh, stop the screen support. Yeah, I'm trying, but it's not going. Okay. okay. Wait a minute. Yeah, I'm trying, I'm also trying. Ashok, I'm making the host, host for the moment, sir. Okay. No problem. So Dr. Drawer is joining back. This uh, screen is still there. Yeah. I think it's Dr. Drawer's laptop that has frozen. From our side, we have stopped the sharing, but uh, I think it's. Uh, this is still coming. Yeah. Uh, it's Dr. Drawer's laptop that is frozen. Ashok, can you unshare the screen? Yeah, I have I have unshared it from our side, no, actually. Yeah, it's Dr. Draw's laptop that is frozen. That's the reason why we cannot unshare it. So it will take some time for it to be unshared. Should okay. we uh, tell the Dr. Draw something on WhatsApp? Uh, he can restart his computer and join back. That is the simplest way to go ahead. Okay, okay. I'll just please, let... Manish sir, please let him know. Okay.
so this has happened few times that's why the disclaimer earlier where internet and technology issue <laughs> were raised yeah so, he is rebooting his computer he just exactly so once he reboots then we'll get him back by the time we can have uh, some panel discussion dr gajewala yes, sure. dr dhiren dr dhiren can you yeah 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 please yeah i am here so we can initiate some uh, panel discussion by the time professor draw dalle joins us yes exactly so uh, uh, can i ask ashok like what is your impression till now like say he explained the anatomy so well which is very unusual before 10 years 15 years we were doing something which is completely in a, a very different way so what right. do you think no i think he analyzed the deformities very well um, you know the three dimensional analysis and uh, maybe in today's day and age we should be able to actually model this very well you know we can do a three dimensional model to understand this uh, on a patient should be possible you know by doing a 3d reconstruction yeah, yes uh, cherry would you like to add something on this like uh, till now what is your experience about that or milin would you like to add something yeah i mean one of the first visualization tools that helps is to run the cd with the 3d ct scan or the mri and run it in sequence i think that Okay, so I think he will be joining back now because his screen is unshared, and we'll have him in few months. Meanwhile, we can go ahead with that. Yes. So, Milin, please. Yeah. Yeah. So, if we take the three D CT or the MRI CD. and you run the series of images in sequence one after the other then it becomes easy to grasp the various planes but uh, you know of, of course the more modern method is what ashok said that you can do a nice 3d model and that should make it a little easy to figure out where goes what and how we have to proceed can you share your experience like what was before the uh, drawer explained about this uh, abnormal anatomy uh, how were the results and now what is the change in the result after that well even even though he explains some the actual anatomy when you do the surgery is so complex that uh, it is a bit of a struggle to get the deformity fully corrected and uh, sometimes you don't have the right implants like he has like the angled plate plates so you have to resort to you know and the sizes of the bones are really small so you have to resort to some makeshift arrangements but the deformity is the the first challenge is to tackle the soft tissues and one of the ways that it becomes easier is the way he told me long ago is wear a loop so since i do some micro i have a loop and by using the loop it becomes easier to protect the femoral nerve to you know visualize things a little carefully the vessel that runs underneath the piriformis because they are really small structures when you start with children who are really small so using a loop helps in many of the newer surgeries he's doing especially even say the ulnarization and the doctor drawer is back with us now yep please yes. yep yeah yeah so you can start uh, the screen share sir Um, okay all right sorry about that i don't know if it was on my end or but it doesn't matter um let me uh nope oh, hold on so i have to find the spot on this uh, just one second it uh I don't know what happened. I lost the screen. You don't see my screen, do you? Uh, we can see it. You do see it? In the presentation. Yes, yes, sir, we can see it, sir. Okay. You're on slide 1. Okay. Uh let me get uh find the correct slide. The big presentation.
Let me just, uh, I'm going to stop share for one second. I'll redo it again. Let me just get to the correct spot. Okay. Um, How's that? Do you see it now? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me just turn it into a presentation. There we go. Okay. So where we left off, we were putting the chisel in and the, the correct flexion angle. And now we're going to replace the cannulated chisel with a cannulated blade plate. Um, and if you don't have this equipment, you know, I, I may... I may uh, talk with my friend uh, Vivek uh, uh, from uh, uh, or, uh, Pete Car Ortho Tools. If this doesn't exist, I'm going to get it made for you guys because it, it's really important that, that we have this exact type of uh, instrumentation available to you. Um, so um, anyway, so we what you then uh, insert. Uh, the blade uh, and take out your other guide wires. Now the plate serves as your guide to make your cut. So you insert another wire, I use a 1.8 wire, perpendicular to the plate at the apex of the bend and I make a cut with a saw. And then I make another cut perpendicular to that. So you're kind of removing a notch and then I complete the cut. So this is completing the subtrochanteric and cut um, into uh, the medial cortex. So now you've completed the, the osteotomy. I mean, this part, I think everybody does very well because, you know, this is, this is orthopedic surgery. The hard part is just to get to this point. Um, the last soft tissue thing you really have to do um, once you've made your cut, you're tethered. You'll find that to move anything around, you're tethered by your periosteum. So look at your peri, and you strip the periosteum off of the distal fragment, okay? Uh, so you strip a lot of the periosteum there, but you're tethered. So you can cut your periosteum, go very carefully. Do you notice these vessels in the back? It's the profunda femoris. You don't wanna cut this, okay? or it's the first perforator, it's one or the other. So just be careful as you cut across, so you don't create a big laceration into this vessel and you'll end up with a lot of bleeding. Um, the next step bony wise is to prevent impingement. So now your, your blade is your um, joystick. So you can move the upper femur with the blade. And so you can cut off the anterior medial corner of the femur into the neck. And as you do that, sometimes, remember, you don't have a lot of bone connected to the cartilage. As you do that, you are risking something that can happen which you don't want to happen. And it's called delamination. So the junction between the bone here and the cartilage is not that strong and it can delaminate, it can separate. And then the bone here is dead and all you have is cartilage fixation, not ideal. Sometimes what I do, and I have not illustrated this, I should probably add it in here. I take a dental wire, a 18, uh, sorry, 20 gauge dental wire. I use a 1.8 wire to drill a hole in the base of the greater trochanter here and I drill and, and I pass a wire front to back through there. I run the wire around and I also make a hole in this piece of bone. And so I bring the wire through this and I twist it here in the front or in the back, it doesn't matter. What that does is it's, it compresses this junction and prevents delamination. 
because when you remove this, now why do we remove this bone here? Is it causes impingement. So you end up, it's, it, this is not a good description. You're really coming really almost into this cartilage of the neck. And sometimes I even take some of the cartilage of the neck. Why? Because it never developed into this offset because it was never in the right position. And so then you, you lack flexion of the hip um, and you, you feel this tethering, this impingement. And it's not a soft tissue thing. It's a bony collision or a cartilage collision with bone. So anyway, you take this anterior medial corner. Um, I often, like I said, put a, a surclash wire uh, between the greater trochanter and this little piece, okay? Not going around the neck, going from here to there. And, um, and that protects you. Okay, the next thing is you need to learn to do some type of pelvic osteotomy. I'm gonna show you three different pelvic osteotomies which depend on age, okay? And we'll start with the one uh, that I, I call the iliac osteotomy. And, um, you know, I used to call this a DAG osteotomy, but it really, uh, it's not really a DAG osteotomy. In fact, the DAG, you know, goes through the medial cortex of the ilium. And my osteotomy does not go through the medial cortex. And it really is, um, and it also, the, this is tr truly the closest osteotomy that hinges on the triradiate, as I'll show you. And, and I, like I said, I've even published this several times and I refer to it as a modified DEGA. Uh, I've had colleagues of mine tell me, you shouldn't give so much credit to the DEGA when this is not what DEGA published at all. DEGA came out the medial side. DEGA stopped short of the sciatic notch. So he made kind of that cut. Dega was inclined, but inclined and came out. My inclination stays within the tables, ends at the triradiate. And I continue it on to the triradiate between the ilium and the ischium. So I don't go towards the sciatic notch. I actually come down the back. Now, this is not the posterior acetabulum. It's a supero-posterior acetabulum because it's above the um, it's above the triradiate cartilage. So this is what I do. So I just recently changed the name of it, even though I have about six publications which are descriptive. They're not results of the DEGA uh, that I called it or modified DEGA. Going back, the first one was actually published in 1998. So I, I think I'm finally going to, um, you know, not refer to it as a modified DEGA, but call it whatever you want, you know, paleoiliac osteotomy or whatever you want. Um, but what I do, and, and by the way, how did I come up with this? I thought I was doing the DEGA osteotomy. <laughs> I actually misunderstood the DEGA and that's how I came up with this. It wasn't some great stroke of genius. I didn't understand that the DEGA went out the medial side. Okay, so I always went internal. And what I got from the Dega is this inclination. Because I knew the Pemberton, the Pemberton goes straight across and also aims for the back. But the Dega inclines and comes out the medial side. So mine inclines and stays inside and doesn't end here, doesn't go towards the notch like the San Diego, but actually stays anterior to the sciatic notch the entire time and ends at the triradiate. I actually find the triradiate. I can barely see it and I can feel it with a, it's soft with, with a elevator. And so I start with this vertical limb and then come across to the space between the superior and inferior spine. And I'm inclining towards the triradiate, literally as medial as possible, almost to come out, but I don't come out. Okay, so I start there. I place a guide wire inclined downwards after I do the vertical limb, and then I follow the guide wire like that on the inside of the guide wire. 
and that keeps me inside the, the tables of the ilium. So um, then I cut the, I also do this, I, I cut the um, uh, apophysis in the front and the periosteum. Why? Because you're doing an opening wedge. It has to, otherwise it becomes a tether. So this is kind of one more change. So there's really several changes here from the original Dega. It's unicortical, it goes to the ischium, and we cut the apophysis in the front. Okay. Finally, we're going to take out the bump. So now we pull out the bump. It is done, uh, you know, by an unsterile assistant. And then we can put a laminar spreader into the back. So the curve is facing concave forward. And we go into the back. Why into the back? So we don't, you know, if you go in the Dega too much in the front, you don't put the spread here because that will cause it to flex and you'll get too much anterior coverage. So I put the laminar spreader in here. And so when I separate, I get the least amount of flexion. And so it opens in the back, which gives me more lateral coverage, which is superior coverage. Now, I want to dispel the notion that the Dega gives posterior coverage. It does not. It does not give any posterior coverage. And uh, this is actually a problem because CFD has a retroverted or hypoplastic posterior lip, if you want to think of it, but it's a retroverted acetabulum. So you're not really augmenting or increasing that posterior coverage. And of course you can't because the posterior lip is below the triradiate and this osteotomy is above the triradiate. Okay, now you might argue that by separating in the back here, you're pushing the posterior part forward. I would argue that's not true because the posterior acetabulum is down here. The part you want to move forward is below here. There is no way that an iliac only, and that's why I call it an iliac osteotomy, uh, you know, Salter called his the anonymate osteotomy, so I don't want to use that word, but this bone is known as the ilium or the anonymate bone. So this is really an iliac only osteotomy, okay? So, which is diff different than a triple osteotomy. So now we get coverage. We get lateral and superior coverage. Um, that's actually not correcting the full pathoanatomy of the dysplasia. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, I open this and I leave my laminar spreader here for a reason. And the reason I leave it there is I just gained length. So I added, uh, you know, uh, uh, the opening wedge osteotomies, whether it's a Pemberton, a Dega, or, you know, my version of it, all of them gain length. And they gain about a centimeter. And so... You're, you're going to tension the hamstrings, you're gonna tension you know, other things because you're bringing the femoral head down. Um, you're also gonna tension the hip abductors and move, they've been slid down, so now they can't get up as, as easily. So this increase of length needs to be factored in before this next step. Now the next step is the reduction of the distal femur to the proximal femur. The distal femur is internally rotated to make the patella forward, and it is abducted to align it. And it is overlapped with the proximal femur, which is held in a neutral position. You then mark the area of the overlap, and you cut along that line. That is the amount of shortening that you have to do. So remember, and this is, I, I'm, Millen kindly asked me recently to write a editorial on shortening and its role. Um, and you'll see that it, the, the theme of shortening is prevalent in most of my procedures for congenital deficiencies, okay? Um, it's in the super ankle. It's in the ulnarization. 
It's in some of the new tibial hemimelia procedures and so on. It's in our treatment of flexion contractures of the knee. It's in our treatment of severe equinus deformities of the ankle. Um, it's, in, it's in contractures of uh, the elbow. It, it, it's, it's uh, as Millen likes to call it, it's the new black. Um, so it's the new sexy thing is shortening, okay? Uh, my institute, you know, its name is Paley Orthopedic and, and Spine Institute. It used to be called the Paley Advanced Limb Lengthening Institute. I'm kind of glad we changed the name because I'd have to change it to the Advanced Limb Lengthening and Limb Shortening Institute. <laughs> I think we sometimes do more shortening than lengthening, or we shorten before we lengthen. Anyway, the shortening is critical, and, and joints like shortening. They like shortening because it takes the pressure off of them. We're not trying to force anything. We basically are doing a soft tissue release and then adjusting the bone to the length of the soft tissues. Think of it another way. Instead of thinking of this as a congenital short femur. That refers to one femur compared to the other. Think of it as a congenitally long femur. Why would I say that? Well, it's long compared to its soft tissues. So it's another frame of reference. You know, Einstein taught us that it's all relativity. You know, it's all based on the person making the observations. So if you're an observer on the bone, you live in the bone, you're gonna think you're long compared to the short soft tissues, okay? Um, or the, or I should say, if you're an observer, sorry, on the, on the muscles, you're gonna think the bone is long compared to how short you are. And so we are shortening the bone to adjust it to the correct length of the muscles. Think of it that way, okay? So it's all in a frame of reference. This is this femur in reference to its own soft tissues instead of this femur in reference to the opposite femur. Okay, so we shorten this and we use this segment of very strong cortical bone. I mean, there's not even a medullary canal in this piece of bone. It's very sclerotic. You, we use this, this bone and we fashion it to the space available and we make it into a wedge and we wedge it into place, okay? And we remove the laminar spreader and use a coker on this and hammer on the coker and it pushes this in and we remove the laminar spreader. And that now holds that space. We wedge it and get it past the cortical margins so that it keystones, it won't come out. The bone is harder than the cancellous bone so it sinks a little bit inwards and that prevents it coming out past the cortical margins. So it's a very stable osteotomy. It's actually hard to pull it out. So now let's come back to the femur and we reduce the femur. Now, by the way, the shortening that we did, I wanna point out something. In the original description super hip, I did the femur before the pelvic osteotomy. I now complete the pelvic osteotomy and put the bone graft in before I fix the femur. Why? Because of two things. One is I want to add the length because that affects how much shortening I do. So in other words, this shortening is already affected by this lengthening here. Probably this is more shortening because I added length. I don't want any tension on this hip, okay? Secondly, the rotation I'm doing is also impacted by some rotatory effect of this osteotomy on the acetabulum. And there is a slight rotatory effect. Okay, that's even more prevalent when you do a triple. Okay, so now we place the graft, we're done with the iliac osteotomy, and we reduce the femur. Reduce the femur to the plate. Now, if we want to dial in an exact amount of rotation, then what we do is we flex the hip. And if we flex the hip, we can see the posterior condyles of the femur, not, visu not visually see them. They, the, the tibia becomes an extension of those condyles. So by seeing where the knee is and the tibia, we can now 
insert the guide wire up the femoral neck. Remember up here, this cannulated blade plate? So you put the guide wire in there and when you flex, you see where this guide wire is. That reflects the femoral neck. The tibia reflects the femoral condyles. So you now have an angle between the femoral neck and the femoral condyles. And if you want 10 plus, if you want to uh, be anniverted 10 or 15 degrees, you can dial that in by adding more or less. I, I've learned you cannot put too much internal rotation into this. No matter how hard you try, it's never enough. So um, you, you need to do that. Now, one of the things I've discovered, I now know why it's never enough. And I'm going to come to that in my, when I talk about the triple. But we missed something. I'll talk about it in a minute. And, you know, that's one of the reasons the super procedure has evolved. Although I developed it in 1997, think about that. That is, uh, how many years ago? Uh, 23 years. Wow. 23 years ago. There are improvements in it to 2020, okay? Which is probably depressing for you because you probably think, I'm never gonna learn this because he's always gonna change it. Um, two good things, one is I'll probably retire eventually. Um, so then it'll start cha stop changing by me. And number two is I, I think it's pretty much where it needs to be. But I, I, you know, the super hip, what is it? it? It's really an understanding of the pathoanatomy of the CFD deformity. And I think what's happened over the years is my understanding of the pathoanatomy has improved and improved and improved. And kind of the last part of it is an understanding of this external rotation deformity. It has plagued me from the beginning. And a big part of that understanding relates to the acetabulum. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Okay. so. You, you rotate it, you get your correct version, usually 10 to 15 degrees, and you place your first screw. And that screw is actually placed, I do it within hip flex, where I can hold it. I put my first screw, drill screw, and then I've captured it. So I've got my femur, here's my mini little femur, adjusted to the soft tissues, fully realigned, correctly rotated, covered and we've done everything basically we're almost done uh, we populate the plate with the screws including one going up the femoral neck and then this last step and this last step is um, ossifying the femoral neck and to ossify the femoral neck we use bone morphogenic protein I know this is a, a, a problem for India because this is a very expensive product and it's uh, generally unavailable. Uh, why do I do this? Because when I wasn't doing this, um, the femoral neck wasn't ossifying in a lot of cases. So I got perfect anatomy and this would stay unossified and eventually the neck sometimes, the plate would break. You know, it's kind of depressing. Um, or it takes so long to ossify, I want to get on with lengthening a year later. Definitely won't ossify on its own a year later. So we discovered trial and error um, after a lot of efforts to ossify this upper part that the, if you put bone morphogenic protein in this, it induces the cartilage to, to uh, ossify. If you don't have this, what can you do? Um, I found a, uh, you can take from the ilium, you can take some matchstick grafts. They, the, the name matchstick is to represent that they're thin like matchsticks. And you, they're unicortical with cancellous bone on one side. So they have a, some, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, cancellous bone on the bone, but they have some cortical bone which keeps it stiff enough. So you create a 4.0 hole 4.0 hole here, and you put a couple of matchstick grafts up there, and hopefully that will induce the femoral neck to ossify. Not as good as BMP. 
the way we insert BMP now is not the way it's illustrated here. We have a, we use the Craig needle biopsy set. We put it inside the tube of the Craig needle biopsy, put the tube up here and push the BMP out. We also label the, gra the BMP sponges with a arthrographic dye. So when I place them, I can see them. And so I, I line them up. Usually I get about three of these sponges in here. Okay, so that's, that's the technique there. All right. Um, now, you're, now we begin the closure, but the closure actually starts with the bony procedure. I know that sounds odd. Well, I can't get, remember the abductors were short to begin with, and then we did an opening wedge made it even shorter. So we shortened the, you know, we appreciated their shortening by bringing the greater trochanter down that, you know, by correcting that apparent varus. And secondly, by bringing the, um, the acetabulum down this length. So we've really lengthened uh, the distance and we cannot close the apophysis. So I cut across here and uh, close the apophysis. And now I have that extra graft. So I cut this into little wedges and I put them inside the opening wedge of the iliac osteotomy. Okay, so that becomes, you know, a way to bone graft, you get extra bone graft and it's called um, the iliac shortening osteotomy. And and, it, and now you see it because of the abductor slide. The abductors have slid distally. Now, one of the great things about that, you know, the, the um, hip abductors, a really interesting muscle in that they're one of the very few muscles that are connected to their own growth plate. So this, this apophysis can grow them back up. Secondly, it is one of the very, very few muscles whose circulation comes from distal to proximal and not proximal to distal. So you can see the circulation and nerve origin are distal. And because of that, sliding them distally doesn't stretch the nerve vascular bundle. In fact, you can completely take down the abductors. In some of the most severe cases, I go all the way to the posterior iliac spine and let the entire muscle slide. And then I have to remove the entire top of the ilium to close it. And only reason I can do it is because the nerve vascular bundle comes from distal. This is a huge thing. It allows us to manipulate this muscle in a way that we never knew before. And it maintains the muscle length relative to its tendon length. So the muscle tendon length ratio is critical to what's called Blix curve, which determines the strength of this muscle. So we don't see any weakening of the hip abductor muscles because we're preserving the muscle tendon length ratio. We can only do that because of this anatomic um, you know, uh, uniqueness of this muscle, having its nerve vascular origin distal to proximal and not proximal to distal. I mean, very few muscles have that property. So it gives us this, you know, unique ability to do this. Okay. Now we close the apophysis and um, don't forget to pull over the external oblique muscles and suture them into place. If you don't suture them into place, I've had four cases of ventral hernias. Okay, and it's all from taking off the external obliques. And so since we suture them in place, we don't have that. So again, we made all these mistakes in the beginning and now we've learned. Lastly, um, we transfer the rectus femoris tendon back to, its, to, to an attachment, but it can't reach to its original anterior inferior spine. We have nothing to do with the tensor fasciolata muscle so we connect the tensor fascia lata muscle to the rectus femoris muscle. And so it's like a tendon transfer. That's also another code we code for. And we connect those two together. And so the rectus is attached against 
to the pelvis, but it's using the tensor as its new tendon. So it lengthens the rectus femoris ten, uh, muscle in this manner. We put two drains, one posteriorly and one kind of anteriorly. There's a lot of dead space because of the flaps. We then close the flaps. Closure is not that intuitively easy. You don't have any fascia. So you start by closing what's called the underlayer. Underlayer is shown here. It's the corner of the fat and the corner of the fat. You bring those corners together and then you close scarpa's fascia, okay? The underlayer, scarpa's fascia. Then you close um, deep dermis, subcutaneous tissue. And then finally, we do a subcuticular for skin, okay? And it's a big incision. Drains come out proximally, not distally. And they're tunneled and they're left in place uh, until they're completely dry. Sometimes the drains are in place for a week. Okay, we place the child. It, young children under three go in a spica cast. I'm going to talk about older children in a minute. I hate spica cast. Examples um, this is an obvious neck type. You can see the non ossified femoral neck. This is the super hip. And it looks like we just shoved this into a floating femoral head, but there is cartilage here. And there is the cartilage, I mean, the ossified cartilage uh, on, from the BMP. And where I didn't put the BMP, no ossification. It takes a much longer time. Eventually, it's like that. So let, we'll go back to here. You can see the non-ossified femoral neck and then the ossification. And this is what it looks like on MRI. It's this white cartilage connected to the bone, okay? So this is the neck type, 1B neck type, or 1B2, if you want to call it. Um, and so this is the non-ossified femoral neck. Um, and then with the BMP in there, there's your iliac osteotomy, by the way. There's your, your look at the version of the hip. Okay, this one had a super knee as well. And then you can see the, the neck beginning to ossify. Sometimes you get leakage of the BMP and you get all this bone. So I'm very careful to plug the whole of the BMP with bone wax now. Um, and eventually it fully ossifies. One of the downsides of all this, it leads to closure of the growth plate of the femoral neck at a very young age. And so when they're older, they do get overgrowth of the trochanter and I'm frequently closing off the, I mean, not closing, transferring the greater trochanter, doing a relative neck lengthening at a later age. Uh, we can talk about that, but um, so, but at least it solves the problem. You're not going to get recurrence. You can get on with the lengthenings. And in fact, you can see this girl, there's her knee. And then we look at the amount of growth. This is kind of right after the super hip. And look how much growth she got even before I did her lengthening. That's in, in one year, okay? She got that much growth. And so they actually are growing. It's very interesting. You can compare the rate of growth after the super hip with the opposite side, and they grow faster on this side than that side, which is really interesting because it means that this is not a hardware problem. This is not a growth plate problem. This is a software problem. There's something wrong with the messaging to this growth plate because they're able to grow. And I think that growth is related to the untethering of the, um, untethering of the uh, growth plate by the shortening. So the shortening we know stimulates growth. So you often get one or two years of this overgrowth, by the way. I don't know how long it continues because we always lengthen them. And um, so we never get to watch how long it continues. Um, here we lengthened, always crossing the knee. I'm not going to be talking much about lengthening today. And articulate across the knee. Sometimes I'll articulate across the hip. Um, I designed a fixator that you have in India um, that Pitkar uh, uh, manufactures. I'm blocking on the name of the device, but you guys all know it. We demoed it. And it has these hinges 
across the knee and across the hip. So you can do that. It's similar to this device, which was the Smith & Nephew MRS device, which I first designed. I have a new one now in the US called the drive rail, but the, what you have there works perfectly fine for lengthening. Uh, this is, we always rod after removal, either with a brush rod. Now we have a new thing called the slim rod, which screws into the top. And now we're doing a lot of our second lengthenings with the uh, precise or stride nails. And, uh, you know, so this is a uh, lengthening at a older age and then consolidation. Of course, you could do lengthening with the fixator second and third time, which we've done many times. Uh, we liberally use, by the way, uh, hemipyphsiodesis, um, you know, for the valgus of the knee. And here you can see her, her second IM lengthening and combined with an epiphysiodesis and methazo procedure, kind of my modification of the methazo, really closing the growth plate with getting five centimeter gain here and another five centimeter lengthening here. So she, she got eight centimeters first lengthening and then she got two five centimeter lengthenings. Um, you know, so she got 18 centimeters length plus five centimeters of shortening here. So uh, about 23 centimeters total equalization, which made her equal at skeletal maturity. Okay, here she is at age 12 and you can see she's equal. And she is going to undergo the osteotomy and transfer of the greater trochanter. I haven't done that yet. Uh, here's a subtroche type. And you know that one I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, and that was my one of my first ones in 1997 or eight. And here you can see this, the appearance, and that one doesn't need BMP because you end up resecting the subtroche, uh, you know, delayed ossification cartilage. Um, and there it is after one procedure, and then in those this is in 1990s. We lengthened with the Lazarov device, so hinge device at the knee. This is carbon rings, that's why you don't see them. And uh, so nothing wrong with doing that, it's just bulkier. Um, we've got eight centimeters and then a lot of PT, of course. That's after super hip and one lengthening and then subsequent lengthening was done with, uh, she actually had an LON once before this and then she had the implantable lengthening and um, one of the things we're finding with the degosteotomy, which she had originally, is that um, there, there's, this was from her dega. You see the coverage. Looks great. And somehow by the time that they're older, they're uncovered. So I had to do uh, in her a, a PAO to get her covered before her last lengthening. Okay, so keep watching. Just because you did one pelvic osteotomy, you may end up having to do another one. So I did a PAO and then I did her final lengthening with a nail or maybe two final lengthenings. And I mean, this is, you can see how nicely covered she is. This is her walking. She, she walks basically with almost no limp. She's great. She's in, this is her college dorm. Uh, you know, she lives a normal life. Very happy, age 20. Um, another girl, subtroke type with a flexion contracture of the knee. So we had to, not only correct that, but flexion contracture of the knee, we did a posterior capsulotomy and that uses up length. So you have to do more shortening in that than normal. Um, that was super hip. You see, she outgrew this a lot because originally that was down to the growth plate. And uh, we lengthened her and uh, she's now undergoing a, uh, uh, a rod lengthening of her femur with an implantable device. So you know, just some examples. Now, I wanna move from there to a different type of pelvic osteotomy. And I mentioned that we're, the, the whole family of iliac osteotomies, whether it's a Dega or the Paley type or Pemberton or any of those, is actually the wrong osteotomy. Even the Salter, it's the wrong osteotomy. It works, it gets you through the first lengthening. But as we're seeing longer follow-up of these patients, we're beginning to appreciate that the problem in these kids is that they have, it's hard, it, it's a global deficiency of the acetabulum. It's just a hypoplastic acetabulum. So when you get a um, CT scan and you get, you draw your lines, you see that they're so-called retroverted acetabulum. So they, their anterior coverage is okay. Their posterior coverage is 
decreased and their lateral and superior coverage is decreased. So because of that, when you do an iliac type of osteotomy, you're not going to get coverage. And with the lack of coverage, you know, from those, um, you're stuck because you can't get the posterior coverage. I mean, some of them are going to want to sublux out the back. And we've seen that. And, and part of the recurrence of, of their, you know, their the so-called outgrow the dega or outgrow the iliac osteotomy. And I think it's because we never really corrected their full, the, the real pathoanatomy of the dysplasia. So we published recently uh, uh, a paper um, on the direct lateral approach for the triple. Uh, I've published this before in, um, in some book chapters and I can certainly make any of these available. Uh, I can send them to Manish and he can distribute them. Um, these are illustrations from both the article and also the book chapters. Um, so you've got this all exposed. So when you're doing a super hip, it's really easy to do a triple. It doesn't take much more exposure. You're already anterior, lateral, and posterior. You're already exposed at the femoral and sciatic nerves. So all you got to do is expose a little bit more medially, get to the pubic eminence, which is really the triradiac cartilage. So where the triradiac cartilage comes out the front, there's a bump there. We call it the pubic eminence. And um, you want to get medial to that to cut the pubis into the obturator foramen. So you identify that, elevate everything subperiosteally and cut it in an oblique manner like this. Um, I tee off the periosteum on the front to free it up for, so it can move after the osteotomy. You then go to the back. Well, we've already exposed our sciatic nerves. So you expose your nerve and you don't actually pull on it. I don't actually touch it at all. I keep it under direct vision and I actually put a home in, I don't know if it shows, I put a home in, in the front here. So I don't touch the nerve. I retract the nerve indirectly by pulling on the gluteus maximus muscle. So you pull the gluteus maximus and that kind of moves the nerve a little bit. And then you identify the correct level with the image intensifier. Um, on the lateral side is the biceps tendon. You kind of elevate it. I don't cut the biceps tendon. And then you also kind of go just inferior to the obturator internus uh, muscle. And um, so then you get a homen on the inside of the obturator foramen, like this, and use an osteotome, direct vision. And that's the beauty of the lateral approach, is you can get a direct vision. So I do this for my DDH. It's great if you have to do femur and pelvic osteotomies together, because this is the same exposure you do for the femur as you saw for the super. You, you know, and uh, you don't have to take down the, the fascia lata and a DDH. You just go through it as opposed to here where we resected it. Okay, so you cut there. So that's your second cut. Your third cut, and remember, here there's no bump. The patient's pelvis is horizontal, so you've taken the bump out. You go front to back from the superior spine or above the superior spine, straight to the sciatic notch. That's on the lateral side. But on the medial side, I go to the brim of the true pelvis. So the false pelvis is here. And when I get to the brim of the true pelvis, I turn about 60 degrees or 120 degrees angle, and I cut into the sciatic notch all the way. Unlike the Gantz osteotomy where you come down here, it is also the same angle, but all the way into the sciatic notch. Okay. Now, once I've done that, usually I'm done. There's some extreme examples where I'm really dysplastic, like some of the ones you saw. 
really dysplastic. I'm going to need to rotate this acetabulum more than usual. The only tether I have is the sacrospinous ligament. So I don't really see it from the inside. I can palpate it, but I can see it from the outside. So on the outside, you, you see the sciatic nerve, kind of move it out of the way. You don't retract it. Um, one more thing to watch out for. You may see the pudendal nerve. Okay. I'm saying words that make every orthopedic surgeon uncomfortable, sciatic, pudendal. These are not structures. Most of you are, most of you are not used to swimming in this swimming pool with sharks. Okay. I love swimming with sharks. Okay. My house is on the ocean and I swim with sharks all the time. So, um, you know, just got to treat them nicely and uh, they're your friends. If you treat them like your friends, they don't hurt you. And so I'm very careful. And in these, I'm not recommending this to most people, but you can take a blunt scissors. Your finger is this white thing in here. See the white over there? That's the finger. It's on the inside and you can curve your finger around. So it's on the inside of the ischial spine and you can see your finger. You can almost cut the, you almost end up cutting your glove and you cut with blunt scissors. So they're not sharp. So you can push them on either side. Your finger feels the edge. There's nothing you're going to cut on the inside. Pudendal nerve is away from you. Sciatic nerve is away from you and you cut it. It's, so I'll tell you, I've shown this to a lot of orthopedic surgeons. Very few have done it. Um, in most of them, it causes coronary artery spasm. Um, so I don't know. I, I must have tough coronary arteries. They don't bother me at all. Uh, but I've never actually caused a harm from this procedure. Never cut the, any vessels on the inside of the pelvis or anything else. But I don't do this in most patients. I do it in, in extreme, extreme dysplasia. I do it in teratologic hips, which have really flat acetabulum, because you won't get enough coverage, okay, with those unless you cut this. So I'll leave it to you whether you want to do this or not. The other three cuts, it's very straightforward how to do it, and I've shown you how to do it safely, okay, and um, so I highly recommend doing that. But you can see the sacrospinous is a tether to this periastabular segment. And because of the triradiate, there, I mean, cutting above it is really hard. You're probably gonna damage the, the um, triradiate cartilage. So I, I, I find this much easier. Easy ischial cut, easy to move. Okay, just different view. Now, the other thing I wanna teach you is what I call the coordinate system. So the coordinate system is an XYZ plot pure Euclidean geometry, okay? And you line it up so that the patient is horizontal on the table, that blue line's the table, patient is lying horizontal, okay? The z-axis is parallel to the horizontal, but it's in line with the vertical of the body, okay? The y-axis is front to back, okay? And the x-axis is the frontal plane. So the y-axis is in the sagittal plane. The x-axis is in the frontal plane. And the z-axis is the, um, is the, the, the axial plane of the body, if you want to think of it that way. If you think in x, y, z, then you can start thinking how to move a pelvic segment. And, you know, I've seen lots of people's descriptions, Gantz, Tonus, you know, um, Steele, uh, Su Sutherland, uh, lots and lots of people. And no one ever talks about this. And it's like impossible to understand how they, what direction they move their pelvis. So, I mean, you're all familiar with how I think in terms of, you know, reference angles and planes. So I need these reference planes in order to understand what I'm doing and in order to communicate what I'm doing. So when I explain this, I hope you'll actually understand and be able to reproduce this. 
Okay, so let's recall that the we have we have um, hypoplastic posterior lip, or basically we're uncovered in the back. Okay, so we have this spherical surface, and we want to take this reduced spherical area and maximally cover the femoral head where it's necessary, which is you know, superlateral, posterior, and anterior. And, you know, sometimes it's just not enough to cover everything, but we're going to do our best. Where does the acetabulum really sit where we don't need a lot of coverage? It sits medial. So what we're really stealing, we're going to steal some of the inferomedial. We don't need inferomedial, but there's great cartilage in the acetabulum all the way down to the cotyloid notch. So we're going to take the inframedial part of the acetabulum and steal it and move it more superiorly, which then gives us more superolateral coverage. We're going to steal anteromedial, which we don't need also, and we're going to give that to the back. So we're going to rotate giving preferential treatment to the posterior side. And, and what's left, we're going to leave enough anterior coverage so the hip doesn't dislocate anteriorly. That's what we want to do. So how do we do this? We start by correcting around the z-axis, okay, by internally rotating the acetabulum, internally rotating relative to the spine, let's say, so relative to the sacrum, you're internally rotating the uh, triple segment, the periastabular segment, okay? So the periastabular segment is rotating internally. What does that do? It makes the posterior lip more prominent, and it moves the posterior lip more lateral. It moves the anterior lip more medial. So we actually lose anterior coverage, and we gain posterior coverage, okay? So let's just, you almost have to like write it down. I just, by rotating around the Z, I gained posterior, I lost anterior. So keep that in mind, okay? Next, I'm gonna rotate around the Y axis, which is the, um, you know, front to back plane, okay? And so this is, allowing us to tilt laterally or tilt medially, the periastabular segment. It's called abduction rotation, but I've had people say it's very confusing because you're not abducting the hip. You're really, so I'm gonna remove that word abduction. It is lateral tilt, okay? Now, what did we do? With lateral tilt, we gain superolateral and we lost inferomedial. So inferomedial, there's less covering the inferomedial part of the femoral head. Okay, that's a fair trade. We need more superolateral than inferomedial. And lastly, okay, and, and now, so let's look at what we've got so far. We've gained posterior coverage We've gained superlateral coverage, but we've lost a lot of anterior coverage, okay? So we don't want, we want anterior superior coverage, just anterior superior. So how do we get that back? We flex this. And by flexing this, we get a little bit of return of the anterior coverage, okay? Flexing it is creating an opening wedge, you see? So first was pure rotation. There's no wedging of anything, right? We're kind of rotating around the flat cut of the ilium, right? Which sticks the, sticks the cancellous bone sticking outwards out here. So you see actually some displacement. Second, we wedged it open laterally creating that lateral tilt.
but it's just as open posterolaterally as anterolaterally. And third, we kind of close it posteriorly and open it anteriorly. Okay, pure flexion. So that's the X, Y, Z. So let's look at this. The normal acetabulum, you see, has no crossover sign. Here's the anterior part, and here's the posterior part. Okay, has good posterior coverage, has enough anterior coverage. Okay, the abnormal one has a crossover sign. There's the posterior lip, very hypoplastic, and the anterior lip is crossing over. Okay, so here it is. See the crossover sign? There's the posterior lip, there's the anterior lip. So we, and a lot of this is unossified, so you don't appreciate it. So what do we do? We're gonna start by rotating around the Z axis. So we purely rotate around the Z. Now I want you to see something. Here you had a crossover sign and the acetabulum is facing laterally. Okay, it's not facing forward. Normal acetabulum faces forward. We just made it face forward. Okay, so when we did this though, we lost our anterior lip. So now we have enough posterior coverage. We have no coverage in the front. Okay, second, we laterally tilt it. Okay. And laterally tilting it, what do we get? We get superolateral coverage. We lose some inferior lateral. Again, you see here, still have good inferior coverage, but we're going to give it up. Oh, sorry. We're going to give it up by tilting laterally. So when we tilt laterally, we lose some of that inferior medial but we gain superolateral. So now we have a better source seal. And then lastly, we're gonna flex because problem is, okay, we got a good posterior lip. We now have good lateral superior lip, right? We're missing any anterior coverage. The hip could slide anteriorly. So we're gonna roll it forward. And if you look here, here we have no anterior coverage, but next when we roll it forward, now we're beginning to look just like this one. You see? So now we have enough anterior coverage. And so with everything in place and our little femur there, you can see we're nicely covered and we have good posterior coverage now, good superior coverage and good anterior coverage. We've lost inferomedial. If you look at the normal side, it has better inframedial coverage. We've lost that here. Doesn't matter. It's not that important. Okay. And lastly, we have to consider we can't get our can't get our apophysis back in place. So we're probably gonna have to take a little bit of bone off the top here. That's what's different versus DDH. DDH, you don't have to do that. But here, remember, we also did a super hip. So we have to take some bone off the top. And now we can fix it with three antegrade and one retrograde, sometimes two antegrade, one retrograde. I will tell you, teach you a couple more tricks that I do. And I'm going to have to get them illustrated because they weren't in this original batch. So I, in order to manipulate this, so after I finish the cuts, all right, I'm in this position. Um, but let's look at it from the front. It's actually easier to see. In this position. So I haven't moved anything. Um, we've discovered that we create a complication sometimes. It's, you know, sometimes it, these osteotomies don't move so easily. So, and we get a little bit too rough. And what happens is you break the triradiate. You actually break it. You get a, a pifseolysis because you put this, you put this clamp, where was it? That, there. You put this clamp there and you lever and you end up breaking 
right through here. So first of all, I mean, two things you can do. One is when you do the original cut, you make a T-shaped cut in the periosteum. So this can poke up and it's more loose. Second, you really cut the periosteum around the ischium to allow it to move. But the third thing is really easy. I take a wire, a 1.8 wire, and I drive it across the triradia in the bone. So I just drive it from the side here, right into here. So now it prevents epiphyseolysis. The second thing is when you put your clamp on here, it slips off on the medial side. See on the medial side, I don't have a picture of the clamp. This surface is, is funny shape. So when you go to manipulate, it just slides right off. So the other trick is to put a wire from the lateral to the medial side so that where the, where the clamp comes across here, when it tries to slide upwards, it hits the wire. So you just put a wire in, cut it off, and it just prevents it sliding. So those are two additional tricks that I really need to publish in, in, in the final manuscript of this. Um, and then you get your coverage. So I prefer the parastevere triple. The problem is in, in two-year-olds, it's really hard to fix it, really hard. So I still do the iliac osteotomy only in two to three-year-olds, even three to four-year-olds. At four-year-olds, I do this triple. And in fact, I'm now doing it in three-year-olds. Um, I use very small screws now, 2.7 screws, instead of what I did, the three, five screws that normally we use, you know, so instead of these screws, which are three, five, okay, I use the two sevens in, in, in younger kids. Or you can just use Steinman pins like Salter used to use. Um, but it is, if you really understand what I just explained, you'll suddenly be able to do incredible pelvic osteotomies for anything because you'll understand where your deficiency is and you understand which manipulation covers what. Okay. So, um, this is a previous failed hip surgery patient and previous failed lengthening, not, not of mine. Um, I read, I did a super hip on this. And I did a parastabular triple. It just shows you two antegrade, two retrograde in this one. Okay. And that was the first step. Second step on her was lengthening. Okay. That went very well with the articulated across the knee. And third step was lengthening. Oh, by the way, I lengthened her femur and tibia together. And she was very active the whole time. She's actually a competitive swimmer. She never stopped. Um, Hemiopyphysiodesis, that's very common. I mean, this is her flexibility. That's her dad on the bottom. <laughs> Pretty cool. Lastly, you could take the same principles and apply them to the gaunts. So what happens if you have an adult patient never treated before who needs a super hip? And by the way, I just uh, treated a guy. He's of Indian origin. He just moved to the U.S. He is 30, no, 20, sorry, 28 years old. He's a software engineer in Seattle. And um, in fact, one of you that's on the call has, has watched him and treated him in the past when he was an infant. And I did a super hip on him as, at 28. So I did a Gantz osteotomy, right? It's not a triple anymore. And, um, and so you can do this. In adult. So you can see here, what's the process of doing it? It's the same. So you've got the same exposure, same super hip. The difference is when you start, instead of you, you slide the iliacus, but you don't slide the abductors until you cut off the crest. So you take the top of the crest because you don't have an apophysis and you, the top of the crest for a centimeter, you take it as one piece of bone together with the entire abductors. 
and then you slide them, okay? You do your uh, super hip procedure and you do your pubic cut, you do your ischial cut, just like we did. Uh, what, I'm sorry, not completely, sorry, no, to Gantz. You do it from the front, but you can actually witness it and see it and protect your sciatic nerve, which you can't in a normal Gantz. So you can cut, it's a two thirds cut of the is ischium. Then you do your iliac cut of the false pelvis, and then your iliac cut of the true pelvis. Okay, like you do in a Gantz, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details. You know, you're in front of the ischial spine, you stop there, and then you complete your ischial cut from the inside, okay? Leaving a bridge so that the pelvis is in fact, the pelvic ring remains intact. So with this five-step cut, the only difference is you're taking off the abductors here because this is a super hip. And then you put your joystick in and you use your lion jaw clamp and you move them around in the exact same way. Internally rotate, laterally tilt, flex. And then the last step is you gotta take off some of the ilium because you can't put this piece back. And then you remove, shorten the ilium and put this piece back. And so now when you put your screws in, you're putting them through the whole thing. Say internal rotation, lateral tilt, flexion, and then you can see the final position. Shorten the acetabulum, I mean, sorry, the ilium, and put this fragment back and you put your screws in, okay? So that is uh, the Gantz with the super hip. Now you replace it with uh, three, five screws or four or five screws, whatever you like. I use three, five screws. Here's an example. This is a 24 year old woman with CFD untreated. And you can see she has a dislocated knee, dislocated patella. She has the severe coxivera and that she wears this horrible prosthetic. Her foot's in equinus. Um, she has no knee joint. She has a rotatory subluxation of the tibia on the femur, external rotatory subluxation, dislocated patella, very dysplastic acetabulum. Okay, that's her proximal femur. That's after the surgery. Look at the extreme amount of correction of this tablet. Here's exactly what I was saying. Look how there's no medial coverage anymore. There's no inferomedial coverage. I, you have to give something up, but that's okay. She's got great lateral, great superior, and even anterior coverage. This is her ability to abduct actively. This is her ability to flex actively after this. This is the difference in prosthetic without any lengthening. She's now wearing an articulated AFO with a false foot, okay? So there's the articulated AFO, so she can move her ankle and she has a tibial pylon and a false foot. And that's before doing this, after she's healed, before doing any lengthening. Look at her knee, I did a super knee procedure. Um, and then I lengthened her this is before the nails were available. I lengthened her with the external fixator articulated across. Okay, I got eight centimeters, I think, in the femur and five centimeters in the tibia, a total of 13 centimeters. She went off and got married and had kids after the one lengthening. She still hasn't come back for me to finish. She's so happy in her life. And for her, a 13 centimeter she, you know, prosthetic is nothing. I think she eventually will come back. That's her active abduction after the lengthening. Okay. And this is her walking. And you can see no lurch. Her abductor muscles are normal strength.
Okay. Okay, and keep walking. And around. this is her knee after that super knee procedure. And you can see, I mean, this is a normal hip, normal knee. I mean, that's how much bending she has after her 13 centimeter lengthening. Okay. A lot of it is credit to our rehab department. Okay. But also she had good surgery. So. Um, okay. Uh, Professor Draw, we have finished. We're going to stop at this point. Uh -huh, because uh, actually we have finished two and a half hours. So can we have some yeah. discussion for 15, 20 minutes? Uh, I'll try. I'm, my, the, uh, my, I'm supposed to be downstairs at lunch with my wife, but I'll try for a few minutes. But um, that's probably the most detailed description I've ever given of the super hip. I hope you guys recorded Professor it. Dr. Uh, with your permission and uh, Dr. Dhiren Ganyawal's permission, can we have super knee at a second? Uh, uh, yeah, let's do it at a sep separate time. I'm not going to be Saturday will be okay to you and Dr. Dhiren, same time. Next week, you mean? Yeah, this week Next only. Saturday, we have a like a posy webinar, but Sunday, we can definitely do it on 17th. Sunday, we cannot have this time. I'll let you know then. I'll, I'll discuss yeah. it both of let, you. Let me know. We, we can always uh, find the date. And, and Dr. Dr. Draw, you'll be delighted that 4,500 people have seen you, watched you. Really? Wow. Yes. Wow. Okay. So can well, we have some um, discussion? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. Dr. Dhiren Ranjavara, please yeah. go ahead. Uh, can we stop the sharing the screen so that we can have a full view? Ashok, yeah. can you? Yeah. Okay. Right. I'm getting so, called to lunch. So I'm only going to do like two or three questions. I yeah. apologize. <laughs> Draw, the first question is, it's a wonderful technique. You explained it so well. Uh, what is a learning curve? How much time is it going to take for an average surgeon to learn this procedure to do it without any gross or a major complication? Yeah. So I, I think it's very variable. You know, um, I think it depends on, you know, that's why I started saying it depends on the experience of the person doing, you know, uh, more conventional hip osteotomies. It depends on, you know, your, your comfort with the, a lot of muscles and nerves and, and bones. And so it depends on your comfort in that area. It's a much bigger exposure than anybody is used to. Um, so it really depends on, on those things. Uh, we've, uh, you know, the, these illustrations are out there and they're, they're illustrated to the, you know, um, to, to great detail. So they do help guide a good surgeon through it. But it's easy to get lost. It's easy to get lost, not to be able to find the psoas tendon, not to be able to, you know, find the nerves and to do all these things. And so one could get into trouble quite easily. You can also get skin necrosis from the large flap. You know, uh, you can get a vascular necrosis of the hip if you end up starting to do capsulotomies and so on. And um, so I think, look, I've done, I've stopped counting at a, when I hit a thousand of these, I stopped counting. So I'm probably at about 1500 of these in my career, which is, well, I'm sure no one in the world will ever get to that number ever again. You know, it should be in the Guinness Book of Records. Mm -hmm. But that's an incredible learning curve. I'm still learning, but, you know, um, you know, subtle things. So look, you know, I've seen the results of a handful of surgeons from around the world. For example, Milland, you know, is doing this in India and he does a really a great job at it. Um, and, you know, even with that, and he'll show me his cases and I'll give him some constructive uh, suggestions of, of how you can even do better. But I, I think, you know, even the level that, you know, for example, I'll use Milland with your permission as an example. And, and Millen was my very first fellow, you know, in 1989. So he's been exposed to me, you know, almost on an annual basis. Uh, uh, it's in 88, I think, uh, since 1988, you know. Um, so I think if you're seeing a lot of this stuff, okay, if you're going to see one CFD a year, okay, you have no business doing this just because you're a good surgeon and you have a curiosity, I'm sorry. I honestly am telling you, 
If you're doing it, you're being a cowboy. If, if you're gonna, if you have a practice that sees a lot of this stuff, then it's important that somebody within your practice learn to do these procedures. It doesn't even have to be the same person who does the, but at a center that does this and that claims to be a limb lengthening or congenital deformity correction center, it's important that somebody who's very adept at the hip and at the knee, you know, learn these procedures. And in fact, I don't think it has to be the same person who does the fixators or does the lengthening. It's more an issue of having somebody within your referral network that you trust to do this. And whether it's within your same hospital or same city or same region or same country, you know, I, I think there, this is not something, you know, this is not something that should be done. Look, every pediatric orthopedic surgeon is expected to know how to do a pelvic osteotomy. Every pediatric orthopedic surgeon is not expected to know how to do a super hip. Okay. Um, in fact, I think there are not enough of them to go around. DDH occurs one in 500 births, right? Not to mention CP, which is very common, which needs pelvic osteotomies, not to mention, you know, many other indications, you know, for dysplasia of the hip. So there's enough of those for people to get to grow on their learning curve. There's not enough of these. You know, CFD, all comers is one in 50,000. I'm guessing that type 1B is probably one in 250,000. Okay. So, so let's just for, for argument's sake, if, if, if CFD is, if, if this occurs one in 250, that means for every million births, not children for every million births, okay? There would be four children with this. Even in a country as populous as India, you can do the math, it's still a very finite number of, of patients. Now, what makes there be appear to be more in India is you have a lot of untreated cases. So in the United States, we're kind of keeping up with the four per million as they're born. Okay. In India, you got to clean up the, these patients all the way to the age of 30, let's say, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of them to, to do. So there's, there's more in India. I mean, you guys have more opportunity to see this than in the United States. Okay. But keep that in mind. I think it's, look, I don't, think you need to be Superman to do the super hip. Okay. Think you need to be a technically good surgeon with a good three dimensional sense. Um, and, you know, experience. I mean, some surgeons can do it the first time round. Um, some really good surgeons, you know, first time I did a rotation plasty, I talked to, Ken Brown on the phone for two hours and the next day I did one. Okay. <laughs> I don't recommend that for everyone. That's even, even, it's a 10 times harder operation. Okay. But I have the ability. Okay. Maybe I have a little bit of the bravado of doing it, but I did it very carefully and, and I don't, I don't, I don't uh, play dice with my patients. You know, I take very good care and I, and so you have only you can assess your true skill, your true ability, and whether you can do a service to the patient without causing harm. Remember the Hippocratic Oath, primum non nocere, first cause no harm. And if you can do the super hip with primum non nocere, go for it and send me your first cases. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see them. Ashok, can we, uh, would you like to ask a question to draw? No, it's just a comment to draw, you know, so wonderful lecture, very brilliant exposition of the whole thing, you know, and um, it's a little bit of a paradox, you know, on the one hand, uh, we try to get a balance between the bone and soft tissue by doing a super hip. 
and then when you do a lengthening you are lengthening the bone but nothing much happens to your muscles of course they elongate but they always cause a problem you know and maybe that is the reason why you get again an acetabular dysplasia you know so you have done a very good pelvic osteotomy you doing a lengthening and then you find the back pressure giving rise to the acetabular dysplasia so these are two different things you know trying to do a shortening and uh, getting balance on the one hand and then trying to do a lengthening and upsetting the balance again you know i just wanted to, that paradox actually is very striking so i just wanted to comment on that you know i i think it's a, a very um nicely put um you know uh postulation of of what we may be facing there's no question that um you know when you lengthen you know there are pressures on the on the hip there's probably pressures on the uh, um on on the labrum and the ring you know the ring apophysis um and, and and so on um i i think the the problem is though and i'm seeing it more and more ashok as i do now mris on all these kids early on the original posterior dysplasia was there it's always been there in fact i i published a paper on this and commented on i think i even showed a a picture of it in 1998 in a book chapter so i've recognized it for a long time i just didn't think it was treatable and then it, it, it and then as i began to un- understand how to manipulate the pelvis it took me a while you know um you know iliac osteotomies are easy they're child's play honestly and um you know so i really didn't become a master of that until the early to mid first decade of 2000s while i was a master of the iliac osteotomy in the 80s and 90s from the salter to the dega to the you know whatever you want to call my iliac osteotomy but and now and i also wasn't a master of assessing the dysplasia before now i think i am i really understand it now i will put out something else i've learned so there is a downside to my iliac osteotomy i've gotten overly aggressive sometimes yeah some of this and i've gone and i've i've now have documented cases of partial growth arrests of the triradiate on the medial side. So a word a word of warning, I mean it doesn't happen very often. They these were usually extremely extreme ones which again makes me think I was overusing the iliac osteotomy. I should have been doing a triple which is much more um protective of the triradiate. The only way you can really get the triradiate with a triple is if you put your screws across it or if you devascularize the entire periastabular segment. So look, there there's there's pitfalls in all of these. Um I don't think we know everything. Um there's a big I there's a big onus on me to publish more follow-ups of some of these which I've 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 done a better job of publishing techniques and not as good a job of publishing results. I apologize. um and um you know it's interesting <laughs> not that i'm making a comparison i i i'm reading albert einstein's biography by isaacson which is a wonderful book by the way and it made me realize you know i'm much more of the theoretical orthopedic surgeon than the ex- experimental orthopedic surgeon do you know what i mean in yeah. physics there's a the theoretical physicist and the guys who then prove everything I I although I do the procedures I I like to think of the procedure carry them out I am not one of my faults is that I have not spent as much time uh publishing our results not that we don't review them we actually do we've not published as many as we should have and I think in that we will learn some subtle things you know about what's the pros and cons of everything and we've done so many of everything we have enough of these to 
to learn. And, and sometimes what we're doing is we're switching techniques, not publishing why, you know, you know, when we started the super app, some of you may remember, I actually released the abductors at the distal end. Right. And I did a slide kind of like, um, they would do for hip replacement where you did the, you know, the anterior third slide. And I did a total slide. It seemed like a good idea at the time until every patient of mine was older and had a Trendelenburg gait. Okay. And I immediately stopped. I didn't recognize that till 2008. I invented the super hip in 1997. It took me 11 years to recognize it and to figure out what to do. So the abductor slide that you see me talk about glibly now was in, was only started in common use by me in 2008, the first one I did, okay? Um, so anyway, um, listen, I'm, I, I now owe my, the rest of my time to my wife because it's Mother's Day. I'd love to stay and chat, but I, I, I took too long to give my lecture. And she's, uh, I'm, I, I've got a few mothers here, my <laughs> daughter-in-law, my mother-in-law, and my, my wife. And I, I, I think... Uh, I've already abused their patients. So, George, if you are more of a theoretical surgeon, not an experimental, then that makes all of us dreamers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so anyway, I, I um, look, um, I think there's a lot more to discuss. Um, the super need won't take as long to discuss. Yeah, and so if, we can do it. If, I, I, I might propose that when we do the super knee, uh, it won't be... Uh, as long as it's not on Father's Day, um, <laughs> um, the um, we we can be more open ended in the discussion. Okay. Sure. It's, okay, and we can yeah. come back to this, and we can discuss super super uh, knee or anything else. I'll make arrangements for the right. week, and I'll inform you. And uh, last comment by Dr. Dhiren Ganjavala. Yes, Dhiren. thank you very much. It's a wonderful exposition and the illustration. I must congratulate you and your artists for very superb uh, doing everything. It, it's like we are doing the surgery. So that was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you once again for she, joining she, with us. She, Pamela is actually not a medical artist. Uh, she's an artist artist. And she she came and competed for the job and told me, that this for her would be easy. And that's why it doesn't even look like medical art. It looks just beautiful. Like you could put a painting on a wall. I mean, she really is remarkable. Um, I am, uh, so the, the whole COVID crisis gave me a lot of time at home. And I, I'm pleased to report to all of you that I've made huge strides in the first of my three books, the one on CFD, and I'm over halfway finished. And uh, so you will have all of this in a uh, both paper and electronic book format, uh, I hope by next year. Um, and I'm sorry it took a crisis like this for me to be able to stop and get enough time to work on it, but it, it has actually progressed a huge amount. Um, so all of this will become available um, and, and you know, so will the other topics of fibular hemimelia and Fibial Hemimilia and Radio Club Hand. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. Bro, can you hear our clapping? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. I'll call this my 17th trip to India. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual trip to India. Trips. Yes. All right. Trips. Be well, all, all of you, and yeah. be safe. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Bro. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you, sir. Bye. -bye. Bye.